Good afternoon, class. Um, checking in. Wanted to put a few finishing touches on comments that we started in class today. And we're beginning our focus this week to look in chapter three at the emergence of territorial states and how these territorial states are really the product of really three different um, plans or visions for um, early Bronze Age society. And that refers to the settled urban um, settlements that were well in place by 3500 BCE or so. Uh, varies a little bit depending on the specific hearth of civilization you're talking about. But as early as 3500 BCE, we see the emergence of some settled civilization or civilized societies. And then their counterparts are going to be the transhuman herders, which your textbook talks a little bit about as having a fairly close relationship with these early river-based um, settled societies. And then the pastoral nomads who had a looser, um, an occasional interaction with these river-based um, or river basin societies. Uh, but not a very close or um, established relationship. So we will go through there, and I'm just clicking through some comments that I made in class today to get through, uh, to get us to where we left off. And the chariot was a large portion of what we talked to today, we, or talked about today. We were We were talking about how the emergence of the chariot as primarily a military technology, um, how it speaks and presents a larger picture of early world civilization at this critical crossroads that steps into place around 2000 BCE. And of course, the big news, the, the headline story of this time is the climate change, the drought and famine that are widespread and are affecting most societies um, of that time. In fact, all three societies, the settled river-based societies, the transhuman herder societies, and the pastoral nomadic societies. And in this context, there emerges, or there's a certain piece of technology, the, the um, chariot, that really uh, gives definition and um, gives a certain poses challenges and opportunities to the societies that exist at this time that are trying to make the shift from, or, or I should say that are trying to adapt and transform the hardship of drought and famine into opportunities for themselves and their specific way of society. So domestication of the horse is a very important precursor, not surprising, uh, to the chariot. and. It falls to the pastoral nomads to make most of the breakthroughs in horse domestication. And because they're the first to domesticate the horses, they have a real advantage um, that, that comes to them um, as these chariots are being designed and adapted to um, being horse-drawn um, transport vehicles. Pardon me. And we see evidence going back, um, you know, even well in advance of 2000 BCE of the evolution of the tools and harnesses and headgear that horses have and that people um, introduce to horses so that they can control them and domesticate them in a more meaningful way. And you'll see that this will eventually evolve into iron materials, which are stronger, more lasting, and um, just altogether easier to use. That will be a breakthrough. We see evidence of single axle, um, two wheel chariots uh, going back to 4,000 years ago. And these come um, rather consistently uh, with our thesis of the Indo-European Indo -European migrations. It's about the same time as the Indo-Europeans are migrating out of uh, Western Asia that we find in Western Asia um, our earliest examples of this new chariot um, technology. And it's worth noting that as the uh, pastoral nomads, the first Indo-Europeans were pastoral nomads, 
as they start spilling out of Western Asia, we're going to see that they have an effort to adapt, improvise, improve their technology. But when they start to come in contact with the settled um, river basin societies, those societies that were the earliest to start adopting the seven traits of civilization, we're going to find um, some dramatic improvements in the technology surrounding chariots um, and horses, horse domestication as well. And so there's a certain synergy here, a synergy meaning when two things come together, the result is greater than the sum of the parts that those two groups bring together. There's a sort of a multiplier effect. And so we see this in the coming together of chariots with these river-based societies. They will make some of the breakthrough innovations. Spoke wheels had already been in place, but we'll see things like wheel covers. You can imagine um, it'd be important to prevent uh, your enemy from being able to put a, a spear or something in the spokes of your wheels and thereby dismantle and destroy your uh, chariot. Um, and increasingly these tools will become, both the chariots and the uh, accessories will be made of various metals uh, from bronze to later iron. So very important um, technological developments that set this stage here. So. Uh, we, I was suggesting in class today that this was a really intricate process, right? That the chariot not only changes society, but it also reveals change um, to that society. And so nomadic and agrarian peoples are uh, going to uh, adapt, both adapt uh, to this, this new technology and it will have interesting consequences. Uh, for both, um, I could say all three, but it's specifically the river-based societies and the nomadic societies. And the first thing is, is that nomadic warfare and the political systems that will be a part of the newly forming territorial states, those first river-based societies tended to be very closely, you know, we talked about city-states, but now we're going to see um, states emerge that encompass larger portions of the landscape and the leaders of these territorial states will effectively control larger segments um, of the land and of the regions in Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, in India, and in China. And what's also interesting to note is that as the technology of warfare changes the status and power of people within a society changes as well. So imagine we have a whole new set of skills that are going to be valuable, particularly in these river-based societies. There will be a whole new host of specializations that are rewarded in response to the driving need that the chariot technology and the domestication of horses um, brings forth. So those are, are worth noting. Um, as I mentioned at the top of my lecture today, uh, there are also opportunities for the leaders of these territorial states to profit from the changing technology of chariots. Um, again, if Hobbes, in his depiction of the state of nature, is that nature um, without government is a state of perpetual warfare, well then here we have the king of this new territorial state, able to demonstrate his skill, competency, and his rightful rule based on how well he can stabilize and um, bring peace and prosperity to the people that he seeks to rule. Um, and there's also a little change in the social order here too. When you switch from a military largely based on inf infantry, foot soldiers, and you move to chariots and um, you're essentially in many ways making the military a bit more of an elite fighting force. Chariots after all are expensive, the skills needed to um, conduct chariot warfare are a little bit greater, so you're really sort of elevating the realm of warfare to uh, another higher realm of society in terms of 
the wealth one needs as well as the skills one needs. And so in some ways you could say that this um, changes the character of society by um, placing a little bit more power and authority in the hands of elites and territorial kings or kings of these territorial states will very much um, be able to make use of that. I do want to note that eventually, you know, by 1000 BCE or so, we'll see cavalry units, meaning soldiers fighting on horseback, not on chariots, um, making the transition further um, to the next chapter in the military history of the um, regions of our, our world's civilizations. Uh, so that will change, but for the time being, chariots will be a very powerful element and they will change um, to some degree the societies in which they uh, uh, exhibit, the societies that adopt them as their chosen technology. So we see also this evidence of the elites and their embrace of the chariot. Chariots become a common uh, funerary uh, object, meaning something that is um, buried with people, for the most part, people of higher social standing. Okay, so in concluding, I want to just talk so the emergence of the territorial states around 2000 BCE features a move of centralized kingdoms. So it's not just any leader who can um, impose and you know, extend his power over a larger portion um, of, his, uh, of his empire. This takes work. It takes um, you know, efforts to reassure the people that you seek to lead, to impose upon them a sense of grandeur in your own majesty and your willingness and your worthiness uh, of rule. Also, because these new uh, territorial states have brought together different groups of people, some of whom are old school, settled river-based society, some of which are transhuman herders who have made the crossover into settled society, uh, others that are pastoral nomads, uh, in order to sort of rule um, effectively over a more diverse society, it's important that there be clear patterns of, of leadership. We, we call this succession. So there has to be a, an um, accepted way of declaring the next ruler so that all members within society see that as legitimate and not just some powerful person helping him or herself to the vacant seat or throne. Uh, also, these territories and the territorial leaders uh, take special pains to create a sense of us, usness. Uh, and this can be done largely through things like language. Um, the territorial states tend to speak, a territorial state tends to speak with a common language. They tend to have similar religious beliefs, um, so on and so forth. And it becomes really important that there be a common identity. Um, and this has proven true in my modern world civilization course right now. We're talking about how important this was even in the late 1800s that leaders of European nation states be able to impose upon their followers a common sense of identity. And these territorial states will be looking at them for the next few weeks and they take root in all of the great hearths of early civilization, Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and then even on into India. So thanks for listening and I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow 